Hello, my name is Janine Waller, and I am the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York, and Harriet Tubman National Historical Park in Auburn, New York. Uh, today, I am very excited to have with us Dorothy Wickenden, the author of the new book, The Agitators, Three Friends Who Fought for Abolition and Women's Rights, which features some of the folks that we talk about a lot here in Seneca Falls and Auburn. Dorothy is the executive editor of The New Yorker and the host of its weekly podcast, Politics and More. She is the New York Times bestselling author of Nothing Daunted, The Unexpected Education of Two Society Girls in the West, and she edited The New Republic Reader, 80 Years of Opinion and Debate. Dorothy, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the agitators and uh, Francis Seward and Martha Coffin Wright and Harriet Tubman, some of our most exciting and influential people in the area. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we have some questions prepared, but I would really love for you to let our audience know a little bit about where you're coming from and, and what your interest in the topic was. Yeah, so this, it, it really started with my grandmother, of all people. Um, I was working on my previous book, which you mentioned, Nothing Daunted, which was, uh, she grew up with her best friend, um, Rosamond Underwood, in Auburn, uh, which was sort of a generation after, after the women in this book. And I was doing some research in that book, and she had sit for that book. And she had said uh, in her oral history that her grandparents, the Woodruffs, lived next door to William H. Seward and his wife, Frances. So I was on a research expedition to Auburn. I had never been there before. And I went straight to the Seward House Museum to ask the director if that was true about the Woodruffs. And he pointed out uh, the uh, Seward's library window and he said, yes, the house was right there. So I, that was quickly resolved. And then the then uh, education director, Jennifer Haynes, uh, wanted to take me on a little private tour. And so we went down into the original basement kitchen where visitors still can go and see what it looked like when Frances Seward harbored uh, fugitive slaves, which was she did for the decade before the Civil War. And so as she talked about Seward, she was very animated about her. She said, you know, everyone wants always to know about William H. Seward, but everyone ignores Frances Seward. And she told me quite a bit about her. And she talked about the letters that she wrote to her husband and her friendship with Martha Coffin Wright and her friendship with Harriet Tubman. And I just was, I, you know, even though I was working on this, this other book, I this just kept staying in my mind. So when I had time to begin to start the research, I did. And as I found more about these connections, I just thought this is a book that hasn't been written and its time is overdue. Who is the intended audience for this book? Who were you writing for? I, it's a general interest book and I like writing narrative history so that it's very accessible and almost novelistic in the way it, it unfolds. And there are so many incredible dramatic moments. You know, this really was the most transformative period in American history, the decade leading into the Civil War, the Civil War, and then of course the subsequent years, which I don't cover so much in the book. Uh, so the uh, I want I wanted to tell kind of an alternate history of the United States in that period because it was a time when women were almost entirely overlooked and Black Americans were either enslaved or, you know, paid no attention at all. They were literally beneath notice. So I tried to think, well, what would it be like if history weren't written from a white privileged man's perspective and from the perspective of women who were actually extremely active and important throughout that period? Well, yes, you, you talk in your acknowledgments about how Frances Seward's papers and were overlooked for so many years and, and that they had been sort of categorized as unimportant, just, just you know, um, trifling things. So how did you decide where to begin with so much new ground to cover? 
Yeah, it was a lot of ground. And probably if I'd known just what I was taking on, I, I would have had more reservations about it. It was a seven year project. But I began, so this, this young education director at the Seward House Museum, Jennifer Haynes, had just begun, they, the, the Seward papers were not digitized yet. They're now in the process of being digitized and they're accessible to all of us online. But that wasn't true at the time. But she had started to transcribe herself some of the letters. And I thought, so I said, well, I'd love to see some of them. That was kind of the beginning of it. And when I was there also, the director of the museum told Peter Wisby, Told, showed me a couple of the letters uh, that, that had been transcribed and they were incredible. They were from 1929 to 33, from Francis to her husband, William Henry Seward, the great politician and um, statesman of the 19th century. And they were, but she was a very young mother at the time, as was her sister, Lizette Warden, who was married to a man who was at the time clearly an alcoholic and he was physically abusing Lizette, her sister, and their daughter. And it would, these letters were just, you know, completely eye-opening. Uh, and so, so uh, uh, Jennifer Haynes knew, she said, you know, there, there, there's a lot more where those come from. So I actually went to Rochester, which houses this collection. I started reading these letters and I just thought, well, I want to see all of them. So I hired Jennifer to transcribe them for me because I have a full-time job. I couldn't be all the time transcribing them in Rochester. And there were well over a thousand of them. I can't even remember. And so just over the course of those years, I started reading them and realized just, and I'd read all the Seward biographies by the time I plunged into this project and I just realized how little was covered in those biographies. So that was the start. And then there was, wow. there, was there was an, there was an archive at, at uh, um, uh, Smith College in Northampton, which held all of Martha Coffin Wright's letters. And so I went there and uh, actually a scholarly biography had been written about Martha, which was very good and quoted from some of the letters, but of course did it sparingly. So when I went to the Sophia Smith collection at Smith College and started looking at those, I, you know, they were hilarious. And as Jennifer said, Martha put the funny into feminism and she really she was just sardonic and witty. And they were, so the, both sets of letters were a gold mine. Wonderful. So the, the book about Martha Coffin Wright, was that a, a very dangerous woman? Is that what it's called? Yes, yes by the, the academic couple, uh, Penny and Livingston. And, and what sources did you rely on to learn about Harriet? Yeah, Harriet Tubman was harder. And it's interesting because she is such an iconic figure. But as we all know, she was the, the, what you learned, at least in my, you know, when I was in middle school, uh, you know, I learned that she was this great conductor on the Underground Railroad. And that was basically it. And I frankly didn't know a whole lot more about her until I re started reading some of the more recent biographies of her. So there now exists some extremely good uh, scholarly research on her. Kate Larson probably being the, the best known among them because she spent decades of her life doing this and she she wrote a scholarly biography herself of Tubman which was based on you know as many records as she could pull together Harriet Tubman herself didn't read or write so that was you know that was a bit of a, an impediment but Kate had done so much work and I had endless conversations with her over the years um, I talked to Harriet Tubman's descendants two of whom still live in Auburn uh, and then uh, she she did tell stories she was a wonderful raconteur. She was incredibly vivid in her descriptions of chapters of her life. And so, and there was an early biography that had been written uh, about her when Tubman herself was describing some of these scenes. So I was able to, and, and many of her friends in the North, including uh, uh, the big abolitionist clan, would take down descriptions of what it was like when she was speaking in public. And all of the, these stories about her life were pretty consistent. And so I set out to try to capture her as a human being as she actually was. And it was a challenge, um, but I wanted to, to write about her as I imagined she would want to be remembered. That's an interesting perspective. When you were going through all of these these letters and, and first and second hands account, what, what was the biggest surprise that you came across? 
That's a great question. I think nobody's asked me that yet. I think it's probably, um, it, it, it's in two parts. Let me try to uh, say it succinctly. So um, in the late 1850s, Francis Seward sold a house and seven acres, as you well know, to Harriet Tubman, just a mile down the street from the Seward house. Um, it had scholars had always described this sale as by William H. Seward, of course, because he was the head of the household. But as I began my research and delved into it deeper and deeper, it became clear to me that no, actually, it was Frances Seward who made the decision. Harriet Tubman was her close friend, not Seward's. Seward was in Washington, first as, as U.S. Senator and then as Lincoln's Secretary of State, while Frances stayed home in Auburn and was very active on the Underground Railroad. Uh, and after the Married Women's Property Act passed in New York, uh, Frances actually, had, what, she had this big inheritance, and this was her land, this was her money, to do with as she saw fit. And so clearly Seward himself agreed, but when the sale took place, he was conveniently off on a world tour for, for eight months. And so, you know, no, no, it couldn't be sort of tied to him. It was a very controversial thing for a woman to engage in a real estate transaction, especially with a fugitive slave. So that was the sale. <laughs> and then, real estate, but, but an yeah. illegal sale at that. Yeah. So that was a great kind of, I thought, historical scoop. And then related to that, and equally interesting, is Harriet Tubman's association with John Brown. And so that story has been widely told. And she first met him when she was up in, in Canada, and he came to see her, and he was asking her to help him recruit men for his raid on Harper's Ferry. And she did help him recruit men. She really, she idolized him. She thought he was extraordinary. But other people, and she, he called her General Tubman and said, Harry Tubman's most of a man that, you know, that I have ever met. Well, so John Brown assumed that she had signed on to this, to this suicidal mission, which I don't believe she ever had. And so it's, it's unclear in the other historical accounts. But as I began to put together times and dates and everything, I realized that actually Harriet Tubman as, as John Brown tried to get word to her, and perhaps he did and perhaps he didn't, she, she was settling her parents in this house she had bought recently from Frances Seward. She couldn't possibly have gone you know, on this raid, even if she wanted to. And my bigger point was that this was a woman who led her own expeditions. She wasn't, she would never, she would never have, you know, done this under John Brown and she would have known how completely foolhardy this was. So she later, she, she's on record as saying how great a figure he was and how he helped to bring on the civil war. And this was, you know, extraordinary, but she was not under his thumb at all. And she never, and so I say she never intended to do it. And I think it's pretty clear she didn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's it's um, amazing how she acted with compassion and with incredible foresight. Uh, but she was not not someone who took unnecessary risks. I think when you look at her history, you know she she had so much knowledge of the areas that she was going into, and and she was she was a very meticulous woman. Who was she just a great a genius of a strategist? There's just no question. And again, that's why she never would have done something like this. Nor would Frederick Douglass, who was also invited to come along, and, and Douglass said, no, no way. Thank you. Well, I think what is um, particularly interesting when we're looking at this period of history is that, you know, as, as um, Martha and Francis being close together, they're of the same or similar social class. They're, they're both these um, very privileged white women. So it's, it's not surprising that it, that they would have had a relationship. You know, their, their husbands are in the same business that, that even at this time, they would have been, been pretty close. So it, but but you tell us that Frances didn't mention Harriet Tubman in her letters. So how were you able to characterize that relationship? Yeah, it was really frustrating. Frances was discreet to a fault. And she, what I believe is that she would have thought that it would endanger 
Tubman if she wrote about her. She did write uh, a lot about the other, about the fugitive slaves who were, some of whom apparently were delivered by Harriet Tubman to her basement. And she did everything she could to help them. Uh, and anyone who came to the house uh, who would ask for money to help buy an enslaved member of a family, someone who wanted, you know, some contacts in Washington. Uh, she, she helped teach a number of uh, young African Americans to read and write when they were in her house. So uh, you you can do it sort of by a process of uh, just kind of, uh, you, you have to kind of put all the pieces together. Martha d was way less discreet and she wrote often, especially in later years about Harriet Tubman. And so you get a very clear sense about Martha's closeness to her. And mo the, the most astonishing thing I thought that that Francis, that, that Martha wrote about was Harriet Tubman's final underground railroad extraction when she came back through Auburn, stopped at Martha's house with six fugitive slaves and just clearly described to Martha, because Martha conveyed this in a letter to her daughter, Ellen, st stopped at the house with six fugitives who included a baby whom the mother had carried the entire way. And then there was a very detailed description about how Harriet would hide them in the woods, you know, during the night while she went off foraging. And then sometimes if she couldn't find them when she came back, she would whistle and they would reply. Just amazing, amazing details. And clearly Martha was writing this to her daughter, Ellen, who was off at a finish, fancy finishing school in Boston to sort of say, this is what it's like to be a fugitive slave on the run. So it, there was this intimacy there that you could clearly see. And then the one final thing I would say about Francis that we do know factually, which proves how close Francis and Harriet Tubman had become by the time the war broke out, Harriet decided that she was going to go to Port Royal, South Carolina, occupied by the Union Army, um, to help to, to, to take part in the war, essentially. Uh, and I'll do, uh, do volunteer work as well. Before she left, she went to Francis and asked if, and we know this from Martha, who described it in one of her letters, who asked if, uh, if Francis and her sister, Lizette, would care for her niece, her 10-year-old niece, Margaret Stewart, for the time that Harriet was in the uh, was in South Carolina. And Francis and Lizette agreed, you know, of course, they were delighted to do this. And then we also know from letters uh, left behind by uh, Margaret Stewart's descendants that Francis treated her basically just as she did her own daughter. She, she tutored her. She, she was a homeschooler. She homeschooled her daughter, Fanny Seward. She did the same to Margaret. She dressed her the same way. She taught her as this, as this descendant of Harriet said, of, of Margaret said, as a, as a woman, as a young, young lady, because I believe Harriet Tubman, who was so both so pragmatic, but so believed that equality for African Americans was only a matter of time. And she believed that it, the, the beginnings of that would take place after the war. She never had any doubt that the Union would win the war. Mm -hmm. She wanted Margaret to be ready for a time when Margaret could go out into the world just as a, as a young white woman could and make her make her way. Mm -hmm. Again, there's that incredible forethought and 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 consideration and and just compassion for other people. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I I would like to come back to sort of the way these women change as we get closer to the Civil War. But but one of the most interesting things I found in the book was the way that. Uh, Martha Coffin Wright is really empowered by her relationship with Frederick Douglass. She she writes to her sister Lucretia often and and has this really amazing wit and uh, is is just a master of satire. But but she doesn't really see herself as a as a public voice in the beginning. She she doesn't really you know she writes to Lucretia. She writes to to her friends, but but um, Lucretia t convinces Frederick Douglass to to publish um, some of of Martha Coffin Wright's work, and and that that relationship really seems to to encourage her to speak more publicly. Do you would you first of all would you agree with that characterization and and would you say that there were other reciprocal impacts on Frederick Douglass as a result of their friendship? Yes, so, so yes, I would agree with that characterization. And it, what what really um, was surprising and interesting to me about Seneca Falls because Martha 
and her sister Lucretia were two of the organizers and the women invited Frederick Douglass to come and he played a very important role there. And he was a world famous abolitionist at the time. And, and Martha was dazzled by him. She had read his autobiography. She really wanted to meet him. And then this essay, this satirical essay that, that Martha had written, um, Martha was seven, uh, six months pregnant at the time with her seventh child. She was 41 years old. She, did, she just wanted to stay in the background as you say, she was terrified of public speaking. So Lucretia Mott read this hilarious essay aloud, which had been published in a Philadelphia newspaper. And then Frederick Douglass came and introduced himself to Martha after it was read. And he said, I'd like to publish it in the North Star. So after, so Martha was very, she was thrilled by this. And then she also made these two friendships there. She became very close to Elizabeth Getty Stanton, who pulled her into women's rights, and then very close to Frederick Douglass. And Douglas, I think, would have seen in her uh, what women's potential was and as a, a crucial ally in the cause. And would go across New York State and stop in Auburn. Martha would invite him to spend the night or have dinner at her house. And that was a, an act of total insubordination. But she believed in racial equality. She really did. And she thought the best way to bring it about was to practice it and to show her neighbors that this was, you know, the normal thing to and the right thing to do. So, uh, and Douglas, of course, believed in that completely himself and would have appreciated that deeply. And he uh, really was one of the earliest and most fearless advocates of women's rights at a time when, you know, almost no man would speak publicly about that. So he, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, he saw Martha's potential and he really did his best to draw it out. That's wonderful. And we're so glad he did. <laughs> and, and that she did, that she 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 ran with that. Um, I, I really appreciate your characterization of, of her relationship with Stanton in, in the book as well. Uh, one thing I noticed like, as we're, we're chronicling the, the activities and, and the development of their activism, as the, the Civil War looms closer, we see all, all three women uh, begin to develop a strong sense of urgency. And, and I, I couldn't help but notice, and maybe it's just because of where I am in life, that as they became, well, what do we call it nowadays, women of a certain age. Yes. Um, you know, they they got to be a little older. I'm wondering if if, you know, they just didn't think that society's restrictions applied to them anymore? Um, or or was it the combination of that and, and the, um, the cultural context, the social conversation that's happening? You know, um, how, how did that period right before the Civil War change them? Well, they were, it changed them, but they helped bring that period on, which was, I found so interesting. And I, one of the questions I kept asking myself as I was writing the book was, how do social movements begin and, and ultimately succeed? And it was almost impossible to believe that either of these causes would be successful, women's rights or abolition at the time. However, as the 1850s went on and abolitionism became more of a thing and the North became more aware, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe published her book. There were all, there were all kinds of, uh, there were bills being passed in Congress that were, the North saw as infringing on their rights. And they, you know, the South clearly intended to expand slavery across the nation, which was you know, you couldn't do according to the Missouri Compromise. So all this agitation was just building and building and building. And guess who was at the heart of it? These three women. So they they both urged you know urged this these movements on to, uh, took took part in them. Uh, Francis much more uh, circumspectly than the other two. Uh, but and then there the, by the force of what they did and others like them did, they brought on this the Civil War. Wow, that's that's pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, what what would you say was each woman's um, greatest contribution to that to that effort? Well, it, it's it's hard to summarize, but um, I would say for Frances, I, I, it's it's really important to say that she and Seward um, led the way in integrating Auburn as a city by selling property that they that Francis mostly had inherited mm -hmm. to uh, free free black 
people. And that, so that was why it wasn't such a huge departure for her to sell a house to Harriet Tubman. So that is, that's really, and again, it just shows how completely far they, uh, ahead of everything they were, this radi they were radicals. Um, she kept up, Frances kept up her pressure on William Seward through, she was an abolitionist, he was anti-slavery, there was a difference. So their correspondence, you know, uh, is kind of electric in, in those crucial years. Um, and I was struck by, there was an, you, you probably saw at the end of the book, a, a black Auburn citizen. After Harriet Tubman died, and there were all these wonderful tributes to Harriet Tubman, he wrote a letter to the Auburn citizen, and he said, I also want to uh, take notice of a woman who made such a difference to um, colored people, as he put it at the time, and that was Frances Seward. And he basically said, you know, her deeds, we, we, we all know in this community what she contributed, and her deeds will always remain green and they will never die, or something along those lines. And I just thought that was a remarkable uh, a tribute to what she had accomplished with without anybody really noticing it and without her thinking that this was anything particularly extraordinary. She did what her conscience told her to do. Mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman, it goes without saying, she was, you know, the really one of the country's great heroes of all times. And she didn't, so, so it was her Underground Road activities uh, from the Eastern Shore and on up into uh, Canada. In, as we mentioned, during the war, she, for, she spent three years in South Carolina and she helped lead a river raid, you know, that, that rescued 750 enslaved people. And this was a time when Black men had only just been, you know, allowed to enter the army and, and Harriet Tubman just kind of, you know, invited herself to join and take play a pivotal role in that. And then she, she went back to Auburn to live in the house that she had bought from Fra Frances Seward for the rest of her life, it was almost 48 years, and she devoted the rest of her life to civil rights, to equal rights for African Americans, to suffrage for women and to, to, to Blacks, uh, you know, uh, black men and black women. So she was just there really, and she, she lived into the 20th century and she was doing this till the very end of her life. And then Martha, who died quite a bit before Harriet did, she left, she knew that this was gonna be a fight, but both of these causes were gonna be the fight of many generations. And so she basically indoctrinated, as did many of these reformers, she indoctrinated her children and her grandchildren in the importance of these causes. And in their role, it was in their um, duty as citizens to keep these fights going. And so she succeeded. Her daughter, Eliza, became you know, one of the most prominent suffragists in, in, in the country. So did her, grand, her granddaughter, Eleanor. Uh, they both fought for women's suffrage. And then, um, her one of Martha's grandsons became a, a one of the most important prison reformers in the world. Um, so he he and he he went in he he hid himself he disguised himself as a prisoner. He went into Auburn State Prison to find out what the conditions were. He came out anyway. The, these groups that he. Uh, the, what he learned at the prison and then a group he formed ultimately became the Osborne Association. So her grandson, Thomas Mott Osborne, uh, began what eventually uh, uh, grew into the Osborne Association, which is still growing, going very strong today, is led by one of Martha and Lucretia's descendants. She was named after Lucretia Mott. Uh, and this is, and the Osborne Association is one of the biggest uh, reform organizations uh, in the country. What is really interesting to me about their legacy, and, and especially the way that we look at it through a modern lens, we're, we're talking about intersectionality now, about how how race and class and, and gender are, are all these different facets of a person's identity that have color their experience. At the time, it was not uncommon for people to support things like abolition, but not women's rights, or women's rights, but not abolition. Uh, it seems like these three women um, lived in different spheres and were active in different spheres that we might consider intersectional today. How would they have seen that? Would they have seen them those issues as very intimately tied? Yes, they, they absolutely would have. And Lucretia Mott, who was so much older, she was 14 years older, 
than, uh, than, than Martha and older than all of these women. She, Lucretia Mott was one of the earliest advocates of human rights, what we describe today as human rights. And she, she thought very broadly about this. So she didn't, Elizabeth Cady Stanton focused almost to, to the exclusion of everything else on white women's suffrage. And that's not at all the way uh, Lucretia Mott saw it or Martha saw it or, or Francis or, or Harriet Tubman. And that was, and I think all these three women influenced each other um, in, in really important ways, I think. I mean, Harriet Tubman, of course, embodied all of this in her life. She was just, she just sort of made all, she showed that all of this could ha could begin to happen. Um, and the, the truth is that the abolitionists and the women's rights activists early on were, were quite closely intertwined. Uh, they, they worked very closely together. The abolitionist men really began to rely on the women to help, to help them with the women's anti-slavery societies. And then eventually William Lloyd Garrison's organization, the American Anti-Slavery Society did admit women. And so they became part of his group and they would ask Garrison and Frederick Douglass and everything else to talk at the anti-slavery meetings and the women's rights meetings they they held. So later on, yes, there was this, this schism, but during that long crucial period, they really relied on each other and they were all friends. It was quite an incestuous group. They intermarried. Uh, so they all, they did, they, they, yes, some men, like David Wright was less for pro women's rights for most of the time. Uh, and, but he was a strong abolitionist. But many of them, most most of them, I would say, really believed in both causes to greater or letter, lesser extents. Okay, I definitely see that thread emerging now. So it's interesting to see how it, it would have played out back then. Um, with with all of the these issues um, being so intimately tied to identity and the history of our country. How did you decide that now was the time for this story to come out? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because as I said, the book took seven years to write and so much has happened in this country in seven years. So it kept changing a little bit. So when I began, Barack Obama was the president, the first black president. And so it just seemed it was the, such a direct line from what the what these women had done to where we were as a country. Well, we all know what subsequently has happened. And so in those seven years, we've seen the growth of the Me Too movement. We've seen Black Lives Matter. We've seen the election now of, of Joe Biden, who has, you know, once was quite a, a, a moderate Democrat, has moved quite, quite far to the left and who believes in many of these issues. Um, but it, it all began with that this generation of reformers. And so the, the book to me just feels so, and, and then, then January 6th happens with the storming of the Capitol. And I just thought, this is exactly what these 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 people were were feared and were you know fighting against. And we got the 13th, 14th, 15th, and ultimately the 19th Amendment. And yet the battle goes on. And again, that's something that I think wouldn't have particularly surprised these three women. It would have disappointed them that here we are in the 21st century and there's we're still fighting the same old battles, but they opened the door. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, we had the, the insurrection on January 6th, and then 14 days later, we had the swearing in of the first woman of color in the White House. So you know, there's, there, there, I, there's a lot to be said for this era. <laughs> yes, two steps forward, one step back. <laughs> So, so you have put your your heart and soul into this. You're you're touring with the book now. What's your next project? What are you going to work on now? Oh, everybody always wants to ask that, except writers. Writers never ask me that. <laughs> they know when you finish the book, you and then you do your your promotion tour, and so you're you're still sort of immersed in this world. However, I do have a couple of ideas. I just haven't. And they may be historical ideas, you know, I but it's which because I so love American history and I love telling it from these surprising angles. Uh, but I'm not quite I haven't settled on anything yet. There are two or three ideas. So I'm just beginning to think about those. Well, you, you had mentioned how in With Nothing Daunted, that sort of spurred you on to the agitators. So I wasn't sure if this is, has really got some some ticklers going for you. I know, and I can't promise that I'll go back to Auburn again. I may have done everything, everything I can from, from that town. 
Well, we're excited to see how you move on. And we'll be really, really excited to see you uh, hopefully later this year, either virtually or in, in person in Auburn. And uh, maybe a side trip to Seneca Falls if we can work that out. Yes, I'm beginning to think about a trip to, uh, to both towns, actually, I hope in September. That would be wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I am really excited to explore another way in which women's writing has impacted our our current society, our history, and, and in particular, these women who are so near and dear to us locally. So thank you so much for your time and uh, please enjoy the, the rest of convention days, everybody. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you.